and welcome to this edition of Trader Talk TV. Today we've got David in the studio. David, thanks for coming in. Hi, thanks for having me. David Walks is a solution architect, is that right? Yeah, exactly. uh, For Permitive. And today we're going to talk about edge computing versus cloud computing. Now, some of you out there going, what the hell am I talking about? But it's a very important piece uh, of technology, particularly around the Permitive uh, offering. So today we're going to talk about that. And David's here to, to run through some of the specifics, because it's important regarding privacy and also putting sort of uh, modeling and segmentation in, in the hands of the publishers. So, David, let's talk about this. What's, what, what, what is edge computing? Yeah, absolutely. I hear it every day. Kieran, that's I'm, great. In, I'm, in, I'm in edge computing, <laughs> going, that's great. Well done, what okay, is it? Okay, perfect. Uh, so edge computing is all about um, processing data very closely to where it is generated. So a really good way to explain edge computing is actually to start with cloud computing yeah. and then contrast it to that. Okay. Um, so with the classic cloud computing model, um, if we think about publishers, I'm just going to start with black. Yes. Um, if you think of what publishers, um, if a user comes to their site, they want to collect first party data from the user yeah. and then build out segments for those users. So what traditionally happens is that data is being sent from the browser into a cloud where it's stored in a database and then it's also processed in the cloud. And that processing typically happens in batches. So at certain intervals during the day, um, the cloud goes through all of the data, processes it, buckets users into segments, and then that understanding is pushed into other systems. So for example, into your ad server, let's say DFP, or into an SSP. So with cloud computing, um, with this flow of sending data from the cloud, uh, client into the browser, there's a couple of challenges when it comes to processing. Um, the first challenge is around scalability. If you process data in the cloud, um, you typically want to optimize against three metrics. So you have, first of all, cost, you have speed, and you have volume. If you want to process a lot of data at reasonable price, you'll have to compromise on speed. The processing is going to be relatively slow. But then also vice versa, if you want to process data pretty quickly in the cloud, then it comes at the price of volume. So you can only process less data in the cloud. So that's like a first limitation of processing data centrally in one place. Mm. The second challenge with cloud computing is around latency. Naturally, if you want to send data from one place to another to process it, there needs to be a network connection. Mm -hmm. And let's say that network connection takes 100 milliseconds. You have this natural bottleneck of sending data from the client to the cloud of 100 milliseconds. You can't come over that. You have to wait for a round trip of the data going there and a response coming back. The third big challenge here is around privacy. If you want to process data on a cloud, of course, all of the data needs to be sent there. So what ends up happening is that for every user, let's say you have like a user ABC, this ID and all of the data for that ID gets sent into the cloud. It gets processed there. You need to have the data in the cloud. And then it gets passed on to other systems. So it gets pushed down to the ad server, or it gets sent on to the SSP. So you start moving IDs into a central location. And, and in the current environment, that's, that can become a very messy sort of privacy-related issue. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's a hot uh, talking point yeah. at the moment, IDs yeah. and, and data privacy. Um, naturally, like what regulators want and what browser vendors want is um, to restrict how IDs are shared in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. where they get pushed, mm -hmm. and make sure that the user has maximum control over their own data, mm -hmm. um, which is naturally uh, quite contradictory with like a model where the data is aggregated centrally, um, where there's very little control about what data leaves the device. Um, what data gets sent to the cloud. Okay, so let's talk about edge because we you, you have three went through it before we actually went on, on air here. So, um, your so basically the the the, uh, the fundamental um, thesis around edge computing is is to sort of uh, lay these three points, particularly in the ad tech scenario. But how does it work on uh, a device, for instance? So like like this all kind of uh, circulates around the publisher power and the first party cookie, obviously. But but how does it work um, from someone like me who might be on one of your client pages, uh, one of your client publishers, uh, uh, Good Food Network, uh, I believe is one of your clients. Um, so let's just say that I'm I'm going through various recipes and how does it work in that respect? So 
you you kindly sort of uh, told me that there, it's a it's a JavaScript layer within the actual page itself. Is that right? Exactly. So when we think about edge computing, um, there's actually an SDK that gets implemented, let's say, on the website mm -hmm. or inside an app. And um, what that really means is that instead of having the processing up here, you actually move it directly to the device. So whenever a new data point is generated, rather than sending it to the cloud to update your understanding of a user, you send it into the SDK on the site. And that SDK is responsible of updating the user state. So you're an mm. example of like a segment who looks at specific recipes. That SDK here, the cloud, uh, the edge computing, would you know, keep track of the user state and it would decide in that moment with that new data point, should the user fall into a segment, out of a segment, should we update um, the score of a model, and so on. So the actual segmentation is done on the page itself. It's on, it's on like, as I browse, it's done on my Chrome browser or my you know, mobile desktop, whatever, or in-app itself. It's, but this is the interesting part, because this is, this is a JavaScript, uh, JavaScript code and it stores information uh, about browsing uh, behavior, uh, not an ID. Let's put that. Let's make sure very clear. Let's talk about how actually that that piece of JavaScript is sort of generated and the importance of modeling behind it because it's just not a random piece of JavaScript here, right? So, how do you fit into that process? So obviously there's there's a, there's a there's a you know a step before that. Yeah, absolutely. So that SDK here. So let's say that piece of JavaScript. Uh, consists of two main components. Yeah. So the first component is actually the processing logic, so yeah. the piece that actually knows how to accept a data input, what to do with the data, mm -hmm. um, how to update the model, um, how to process it, how to update a user state. And then there's a second bit of it, which is the definition that is created by the publisher. So that's where the publisher actually defines what kind of segments do I want to have, what kind of models do I want to run. Um, so where this is quite static, um, the actual execution logic, the part down here um, is, is rather dynamic. Um, that's publisher specific. Mm -hmm. So the, each publisher will have its own sort of uh, modeling process around segmentation of specific user behavior, right? So I'm interested here, how does this work in the, in the grand sort of ecosystem we have at the minute, which is uh, very much about ID matching, right? So how do you feed that information back into the system? Because obviously with the ICO and the ITP, the, the, the information that can pass in the bid stream will be restricted, whether it's uh, you know the law or the actual technology layer above it, which is the browser. So how do you see this happening, or how is it happening right now in the current ecosystem? Yeah, uh, great, great point. Um, so really the first thing that we need to think about is with edge computing, you no longer have this requirement of sending data into the cloud. Yeah. So first of all, you get away from this notion of sending IDs into the cloud and then passing IDs on somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, which is great for the latency point, right? You yeah. don't have to wait for that. Yeah. Um, what happens instead is whenever a request leaves the site, so let's say you have an ad request or you have uh, a bid request that goes out, instead of sharing IDs with those downstream systems, what you share instead is a description of the user. So uh, something like, this user is in segments um, X and Y. And suddenly you don't have user IDs. It's no more a model that's centered around user IDs. It's a model that's centered around an abstract description exactly. of that user. OK. So it's basically the, the, the user's activity on the site that the publisher is sending out. Exactly. It's still behavioral segments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it can still be your segment of a user has shown this behavior over the last seven days. Um, but it's no longer tied to a specific user ID. It's tied um, to the actual request. It's very dynamic. Um, it doesn't expose who the user is. It just gives a description of the user. It shifts the balance, though, here. We're, I mean, we, we were talking about this before, that the, the buyers had all the power in many ways. And the old ID matching was, I'll bring a bunch of my own first party, third party, and I will basically plug it into what you have. And we go, we basically see what the match rate is, and we'll pay you out. Whereas now it's a case of like the publisher obviously opts in the user and the consent basis. If they say yeah or nay, that's fine. You go ahead. If they say it's okay, and you basically build these specific segments around activity on the site, the publisher has the power here. Basically, it's re sort of uh, re rebalancing the sort of the books effectively. Mm -hmm. So do you envisage that this might have to we might have to rearchitect how we do? you know, RTB in many ways are programmatic because, you yeah. know, the publisher has the relationship with the user? Mm -hmm. It's a really good point. So 
Um, Redis is really powerful today is where a publisher has a direct relationship um, with a buyer. So like in a PMP environment, for example. Yeah. Um, with like the shift in, in power, um, with the you know, recent industry trends that we've seen browser vendors cutting back on IDs, what it really means is that the downstream systems here, they don't know who the user is. However, the publisher still has this first party relationship with the user. So while, let's say, third party vendors can no longer build user profiles mm -hmm. and, and offer data, the publisher still has this understanding of the user. And there's a great opportunity of the publisher filling that gap of data that currently exists in Safari uh, and Firefox. Yes, yes, and that's the two massive holes basically in the, in the, in the ecosystem right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what it really requires um, from the publisher is first of all being able to um, effectively segment users, but I think also to really build um, very scalable models. How and scalable is this though, obviously? If you've got like a bunch of, well, I'd say we call them mini wall gardens across the ecosystem, how scalable is that for a buyer effectively? Or is there a way to build a schema across all those publishers and, you know, uh, and make it scalable? Yes, I think like in a, in a future world for like an open programmatic um, yep. trading scenario, um, there needs to be a common taxonomy where like ah. any, any buyer would understand what X and Y means, yep. right? So like a universally understood language. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's like one part of the scalability thing. I think the other part is also enabling the publisher to like fill in those modeling needs that are currently done by third party data providers. Uh, and that really like ties back to, to the scalability piece as well. Doing modeling is actually really um, you know, computationally challenging. There's a lot of data. Uh, maybe to like illustrate it, if, if we think of one model um, as a feature vector, so it's you know, represented by a set of features, and let's say it's 20 features in here. Mm -hmm. And you want to find users who look similar to a subscriber or look similar um, to someone who's interested in gardening content. Yeah. In an average session, if we assume that a user's on the site, that user would generate 100 data points. Each of these data points gets funneled through a model, so we have 2,000 operations here. But if you now not have one model, but 100 models to fill this gap here, this becomes 200,000 operations for this user for this session. And that's quite a lot, but you know, it's, it's not that bad, actually. Um, however, if you then like, scale it up, if a publisher doesn't have one session in a month, but 100 million sessions, mm -hmm. so if you times this 100 million, we actually get to 20 trillion operations. Uh -huh. So actually being able to like, scale this horizontally becomes incredibly important. And I think that's where like, this model helps a lot. If you're able to ship this feature vector in here, and then have each device updated individually, you have huge gains. Um, suddenly you come from a world where uh, you have you know, cost and volume that scales linearly to a world where this can actually become really scalable um, because each device does it individually. Mm. Okay. So suddenly it doesn't matter if you have 100 sessions or 100 million sessions, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, do you think this has been good for publishers? And I mean, I know that, that there's been a lot of um, uh, press around, you know, the, the travails of publishers, but it feels to me the pendulum has swung from buy side to sell side, and it, that's going to be a good thing going forward. Yeah, I think there's a lot of industry challenges with that, uh, but generally, yes, um, I think it really gives the power of data to the publishers. Um, what has happened a lot over the last years is that um, there have been um, data vendors that have been building their models on yeah, top on of the data. Yeah, on the buy side. Yeah, yeah on yeah. the buy side, on top of the data that's actually generated by the publisher and their uh -huh. visitors. Whereas the publishers actually didn't profit from that, um, even though it was like their data. Now that the buy side um, don't have those IDs anymore, those third-party cookies, only the publisher ends up having the data. So I think there's a great opportunity for publishers here. Yes. In what way? In terms of like CPMs increasing or just this? more sort of power over, over what um, buyers see across their own domains? I think like ultimately in, in C increasing CPMs, um, ultimately in, in environments where you don't have cookies, um, the only source of data are the publishers. So if you want to do data-driven advertising, um, the data has to come from the publisher because only the publisher has the first party relationship with the end user. Only the publisher is able to build a profile of a user. And does this is work in Firefox just because obviously Firefox has gone like, you know, f you know, completely born the forest down type thing. 
Does this work on Firefox as well? Because obviously the, uh, we've got lots of German publishers out there. Yeah. Hello, German publishers. <laughs> You're interested in knowing this. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So it, it applies to both like today, um, Safari and Firefox. Um, I think if we think a year or two ahead, um, very likely to kind of apply to Chrome as well. No one knows what's going to happen. Right. Um, but but like, definitely it's going to happen. But That's definitely going to yeah, happen. Certainly we're going to you know, trend towards a world where um, third party IDs are disappearing. And what happens if IDFA is uh, deprecated on the Android ID? This will work in the app as well. Is that, is, that, is that the case as well? Yeah, absolutely. It work in, works in the app the same way. All right. um, I think like an IDFA today is, is very similar to like a third-party cookie, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of like a third-party yeah. cookie on steroids. Um, but then <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same like, concept. Like mm -hmm. once this disappears, um, the power goes away from this third-party identifier and it goes back to the publisher who actually has the direct relationship with the user, who has the technical and, and legal means to build those profiles. Well, David, thanks for your time. Thank you. And thanks for bringing us through the whole sort of edge computing piece. And it's great to know there's another solution there that's going to save the industry. And we'll see you next time on Trader Talk TV.